Top lange komt er dan.
this uh, difference called the Merleau Ponty. So she has a very uh, Ponty phenomenological approach to touch. And I think that yesterday there was a sentence that George came up with when he was starting, which was uh, touch is a social phenomenon. And I think that a lot of Barbara's work has borne on um, the way touch and gesture implicate us in the social environment and serve as indices of the social environment. She's also uh, worked a lot uh, with and around contemporary music, although she won't own up to this in public, so I'm just throwing it away first. Um, and I think that issues of, uh, for example, um, touch as a, as a point of contact between musicians, between instrumentalists, um, the dialogue, <coughs> different types of discourse that can be established uh, via an instrument or via the contact that is established through different kinds of musical creation, which of course don't have to go to an instrument, they may go through one's own modern instrument. Um, these are issues that she's also extremely um, open to and keen to discuss. So I guess with that I'll throw you in. <laughs> and as yesterday, we'd like to we'd like to keep this format as open as possible. But I think the message got through quite well yesterday. So please let's try and continue on these lines. Okay, thank you very much for the um, introduction. Even if I was asking myself if I really were fulfilling your expectations, because it's a very good start. <laughs> so I think I will go. <laughs> okay, it is always a problem if you, as a philosopher, are invited to an interdisciplinary forum because, um, on the one hand, philosophy is always very abstract. That is to say that people who are not really involved in the inner philosophical discourse sometimes are really thinking, what in heaven do they want? So I try to make here an approach, I try to uh, present here an approach, which is um, those uh, characterized by the idea of giving some concrete examples, and on the other hand, to show something of the philosophical discussion, which especially took place in the field of, as um, Sid already said, the field of phenomenology. Uh, when I started to prepare this talk, I um, thought about uh, what is a good introduction and I looked at common language, ordinary language, because the notion of touch plays a very important role in our common language and it also shows the growth of the wide uh, semantic space uh, which notion, uh, uh, which a touch is characterized by. Uh, first of all, the notion of touch refers to the idea of sensation, of our senses, of the dimension of the tactile. We find it in expressions like uh, it has a verbal touch or something is soft to the touch. And it also has a strong relationship to the dimension of cognition. For example, we have notions like she has grasped the meaning of sentences, what means that she has uh, really a griffin in Germany, it's even more clear, she has really grasped the meaning of something. So that means that touch is a very important notion not only for the field of sensation and our sensory approach to the world, but also for the dimension of cognition. I want to speak about that in the first chapter. The second aspect, which comes apparent if we are look at touch in the common language, is the dimension of verification. So touch very often has been regarded as a method of verification. You find in expressions like touch stone or to put something to the touch or in uh, French it's even more clear to see la réalité du droit. Uh, the third dimension I want to refer to is the dimension of the relationship between touch and emotions. We all know expressions like she is touched to tears, she is very touched by his words, she is tactful, she is touchy or touchiness. All this shows the strong relationship between touch and emotions, and I want to refer to that in the third chapter of my talk. The uh, fourth dimension is, I would call it uh, a magical sphere of touch. So, for example, if you are looking at religions, very often touch plays a very important role. For example, by people who are touched by a priest or shaman and were cured only by this notion, uh, by this aspect of touch. So, that is another aspect I want to. Uh, like to refer to. And the fifth dimension is the dimension of contact. This will play the most important role here in my talk. We all know expressions like to get in touch, to keep touch, to lose touch, uh, 
something is within touch, so touch is really the notion of contact, of proximity, of closeness. And that is especially the point I would like to refer to in more detail, also by looking a bit on the philosophical discussion. I would like to finish my talk with the idea that touch could mean, it must not mean, but could mean a kind of different approach to the world, which I would describe as a kind of gentle approach to the world. What means that touch is not mainly characterized by this idea of control and domination, something we referred to in the talk yesterday, but more that it is um, characterized by the idea of the dialogue, and the dialogue with the objects which we get in touch with, the dialogue with the person which we try to get in touch with. So we have the kind of um, schedule for the whole thing. That is, first of all, I would like to speak something, uh, to make some remarks about the um, reference of touch to the dimensions of meaning and cognition, then touch as a method of verification. Then I would like to make some remarks about touch and emotions, some remarks about touch as a magical sphere. Then I would like to go in more detail into the idea of touch as a contact to the other, or to the objects of the world in general. And at least I would like to stop my talk with some ideas concerning touch as a gender approach to the world. Um, Okay, first aspect, touch as a source of meaning and cognition. If you look at literature from philosophy, psychoanalysis, social psychology, we find again and again that a very important first contact with the world is realized by touch. Babies are touched by their parents, they uh, touch them by themselves, they are grasping the skin, the hair, and closest of them, we all know it, if you have ever had a child on your arms, then you know that they're, for example, with my long hair, and they're taking this hair, grasping what they can ever get. And the same thing is, if you look at the contact from the parents to their babies, they always carry them, touching them, kissing them, embracing them. So touch is a very important aspect concerning our view on the first relationship babies have to the world. It's not the only one, we know very well, but it's very important. Um, as Michel Serre, a French philosopher, um, pointed out, this touch of oneself is, as he says, a necessary fundament of getting a feeling for one's own. So by observing babies, for example, you see very often that babies are not only touching something outside of them, but they're also touching themselves, their hands, their bodies, and something like that. And Michel Serre, by referring to uh, Didier Anzieux and Evelyne Seychoux said that in this touching, in this notion of touching themselves, they get a feeling of oneself, they develop a so-called moi peau. In German it is haut ich, and I try to find a translation in English, it's skin eye or something like that. Um, and even if, uh, if we are adults and if we observe ourselves, then we become very well aware that we are always touching ourselves. When I try to observe myself concerning this aspect, then I realize that very often we cross our legs, we press our lips together, we touch ourselves, we could make something like this, so it's a kind of verification of oneself by touching ourselves. By this touch of ourselves, there develops a kind of dialectic relationship between ourselves and our impression of ourselves by, by touching ourselves. This kind of dialectic relationship is something I will refer to later a bit, but we should keep it in our mind. Beside of this contact to oneself, touch is a very important aspect concerning our sensorical and cognitive perception of the world. Now, this is primarily true if you regard the ontogenetical development of knowledge. Touch enables, for example, children to discover the shape, the texture, the materiality, the quality of objects. To get a feeling what it means if you speak about a heart or a soft object, about a wet or dry object. All these raw, polished, warm and cold, all these qualitative information about material attributes are only comprehensive because we have this sense of touch. But the meaning of attributes like rough or soft cannot be reduced to a detailed, explicit, explicit description which we get by some other person. For example, imagine yourself that you try to explain what it means if you are speaking about a wet aspect. It's absolutely not, impossible, not, 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 not possible. And we had this as I used to work in the field of artificial intelligence. We tried to get a kind of knowledge about qualitative 
uh, attributes into a computer program, and it was absolutely impossible really to explain what it means if you speak about raw, polished, soft art or something like that, because the explicit description was not sufficient to get a real meaning um, of what is meant by this qualitative information. So touch is a kind of very important fundament of our approach to the world and a very important fundament of our cognitive uh, capabilities. Following this, we may say that touch is a kind of very important experience, a continuous field of exploration fundament of cognitive facts. Um, we must be able to refer to our sensory experience. You must have met objects which were softer hard by touching them. You must have had developed this kind of contact with the objects which enable us to understand what we mean by this qualitative information. Um, furthermore, there are a lot of phenomenologists which point out that not only touch as a kind of one of our senses is um, a very important uh, aspect in our approach to the world, but furthermore, that also perception and our acoustical perception, our, uh, that our visual perception and our acoustical perception is very much influenced by this notion of touch. For example, we have in Germany the um, notion of abtastender Blick, I would translate it rather freely as a palpating view. What means that if you are looking at a picture, really, you understand what I mean? You, yes? Okay, that's good. But sometimes it's really good to find uh, translations if you are integrating it in specific language. With our eyes, we are touching the pictures and visual impressions, and again, Ordinary language gives a hint or indicates what we mean by that. Because very often, by describing a view or a glance, we are using attributes which are coming from the sense of touch. We speak about a warm view, not a warm glance, um, a glance of fire, or something like that. So, there are notions which are influenced by this idea of a touch, and the same is also in the field of acoustical perception, where we speak about a warm sound soft sound or something like that. So we may sum up, touch is a very important, very fundamental approach to the world. And a lot of our cognitive um, approaches, our cognitive acts are totally influenced by this idea of touching something or getting in touch with the world in general. Okay, another aspect I wanted to refer to is, as I said before, the idea of touch as a method of verification. I had a very nice folio, but as it was the only one, I did not want to, to make the whole arrangement here. Where I was, the, I can't describe it, it's too difficult to end it. Um, in reference to the intertwinings to touch um, and the other senses and cognition, I would like to refer to a quotation of Voltaire. He speaks about, or he spoke about, les mains de l'expérience. That means that according to his opinion, the palpable, that so that what we can touch, experience by the sense of touch, is a source of valid knowledge. This refers to this idea of touch as a means of verification, which we already met, uh, met in everyday language when we uh, look at expressions like toucher la vérité du droit. Okay. Um, in respect to this, I would like to refer to an old story which played an important role in Christian religion. After Jesus died, he reappeared to his disciples at Easter. Thomas, one of these men, did not believe in his real existence. So he asked Jesus if it was possible to touch him, to become sure whether Jesus is something or somebody who is a real person or something which is more a phantom or a ghost. So Jesus allowed Thomas to touch him, and after that, uh, Thomas believed in his existence. <coughs> it was very interesting that Jesus afterwards said that it is necessary to believe without uh, having, uh, without always being confronted with the idea to touch. So that he wants everybody of the people who are involved in Christian religion that they believe in God without being forced to touch him. And Dina Roe, for example, made the following remark in the letter about his blind. He said, Si vous voulez que je crois en Dieu, il faut que vous me le fassiez toucher. What means that only the people who are really doubting in the existence of somebody 
always wanted to touch the thing which they should believe in. But in Christian religion, there was a strong force that people should believe in something without touching it. And I think it's a very interesting story because the whole philosophical um, discussion was always influenced by that. Because touch, you can see it really in the history of philosophy, did play a very, very um, small role, or very unimportant role, in the whole idea of uh, epistemology, of getting in contact to the world, and something like that. Because we really had to believe in what we see or what we hear, and touch was really blanked out in our approach to the world. I think there are a lot of reasons for that, and I think I will mention some of them, but I cannot refer to everything here, as you can imagine. If you look from this point of view, uh, looking at touch as a kind of verification method, at children, again, I think it's a very important field of exploration, then we see, can see very often that children touch something if they want to become clear if something is real or artificial. And I, for myself, if I observe myself, very often when I'm in a restaurant, there are flowers on the table, first thing I do is touch them <laughs> to see if they are real or artificial. <laughs> so, I don't know, for example, our GMB factory, we have always artificial flowers, but sometimes they are so natural that we touch them only to get a feeling of how they are. So, we find, we find a lot of of fields where, where this idea of touch and method of verification plays an important role. For example, in medical diagnosis, which I observed a long time during a research project, um, we have a lot of diagnostic methods. We have this anamnesis, where people are asked about their symptoms, uh, and we have all these technical facilities which enables us, or us, but with the medicines, <laughs> to get a kind of idea of what a kind of illness the patient might have. But then, her patient, touching the patient, plays still a very important role. It is sometimes described by people who describe their diagnostic method as a kind of verification method. So even if you have uh, had a temperature of 40 degrees, people touch the patient to see if this is right. Or you, you, you look at the parts, or you make a kind of palpation when you are trying to get a kind of feeling what the patient might have. So touch also here in some field fields as a kind of verification method, which is also very important. So we may say that touch is an important method to find evidence for beliefs and estimations. We cannot touch. What we cannot touch might be not real, could be a product of our fantasies and imaginations. And it's very interesting if we regard, regard for example, virtual environments and the encounters in so-called virtual environments as mass and moose where I used to make some research that is a kind of virtual environment where people can have contact to each other by exchanging texts, by having a kind of auditive um, contact, by speaking to each other by using the phone or the micro, and also by seeing each other sometimes, for example, in programs like CUC, where you have a video camera on your computer, and then you have a kind of picture of the other one to whom you have spoken, speaking, People have a strong desire to get in real touch with the other one to verify their ideas, their estimations, <coughs> their estimations about the other person. And very often in this context there has been described this shock which appeared when people met each other because there was this big gap between the imagination on the one hand and the real person on the other hand. So here again, touching uh, in the sense of having real contact with the other uh, person plays a very important role in verifying estimations, beliefs, and imaginations. So the first point, the fourth point I want to refer to is the idea of touch and emotion. And I think I have not to tell a lot about that because everybody knows this strong relationship between touch and emotion. If we, for example, refer to the idea of erotic relationships, something like that. In his wonderful book, Fragment d'un discours amoureux, but refers to the notion of touch in the following way. According to him, touch is the domain of silent and subtle signs, not only a celebration of the senses, but even more of sense. In erotic situations, which he described in this book, this kind of dialogue by using subtle and silent signs of touch plays a very important role, perhaps the most important role, the way how people touch each other how people have a kind of contact by approaching their bodies to each other. Um, 
how they touch casually or intentionally, gestures which seem to be without any horns, but which um, carry the whole sense of the encounter already in them. This all creates an atmosphere between people, an atmosphere of resonance and responsivity, of openness, of tenderness, of fragility and subtlety, which shows the strong relationship between touch and emotions which come up, only by, not only by touch, but where touch is a kind of sign where emotions can be explored. Um, the game of touch so seems to be a kind of seems to be responsible for the fact that touch is connected to emotions in a very strong way. As I told already, we know this in erotic situations very well, but also we can see it in everyday situations. For example, if you don't like a person, we really try to avoid the contact. We really try to avoid to getting in touch with a person. If we are interested in a person, then perhaps uh, <coughs> By contingency, uh, we get in contact with the person. We, we try to, to, to touch it. So there is a kind of, as the German philosopher Harris said it, um, a kind of different spatial direction of touch. On the one hand, we have a kind of attraction. On the other hand, we have a kind of repulsion. We feel attracted by something or somebody, or we try to get away from this person, to get out of touch. This complex interrelation of attraction and repulsion, of looking for proximity and distance, of searching and avoiding direct contact in that touch, makes everybody fragile, hurtable, anxious in effect, and on the other hand, eager, greedy, and full of desire. So it's a very complex thing which takes place in touch, and so I think because of this complexity, we can see this strong relationship between touch and emotions. And what is also very, uh, very interesting is that in touching the prominent number, we could not feel only closeness, but as well the strangeness of the other. We, in the same moment, feel the foreign aspects of the opponent number. We become aware of the strangeness of the other one, but also we become aware of the strangeness of ourselves. That means that we become aware of the fact that our body is a kind of part where we can never gain total control of it. And this strangeness of ourselves in being aware of this strangeness of the other body is probably the fact why we are sometimes so um, anxious, I really would say, to get in touch, to get in close touch with some other person. But I would like to refer to that uh, again when I speak about touch as contact. Some um, uh, remarks about touch as a magical sphere. I think this strong relationship between emotions and touch, which I just tried to outline very briefly here, uh, explains a bit about touch as a magical sphere. Um, if you, for example, look at magic cultures or magic rituals in other cultures and things like shamanism, touching was always a very important way to create a magical atmosphere, a contact between persons and persons and objects, which could have a kind of mystical effect beyond the concrete exploratory function. For example, in religions, blessing and benediction is often directly connected with touching the other one. For example, shamans cool people only by touching their bodies, and there are a lot of different cultures in which the magic of touch plays an important role because people believe that a specific energy flows from one person or object to the others. Massages, anointments, unctions, for example, have always been regarded as a very important method to destroy the evil, for example. Magical and mystical ideas concerning the dynamical power of touch have been described by several ethnologists who describe or observe different cultures and for example, some of them have developed the idea of Urenda, that is a kind of notion which describes a magical fluid which is transferred from one to the other by touch. Also in Christian culture, touch has played an enormous role if you regard, for example, the miracle. M miracles? Mm -hmm. Miracles. <laughs> the miracles. Because something was only um, changed, or a miracle only took place if somebody has touched it. For example, 
Jesus had to touch bread and wine, or Jesus had to touch somebody, only uh, to um, really influence the fact that the bread and wine changed. Okay, I think you know the story. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to ask why does touching all these mystical and magical rituals play such an important role? What does take place there? And so we came to this idea of touch as a continuous contact and dialogue with the world. Now I come to phenomenology. But I think, I think it was, for me, it was very interesting to <coughs> touch on these different perspectives to have a feeling for the whole semantic state and the relevance of touch in, in our approach to the world in general. So we can say, if we sum up until now, what we have said uh, until now, that touch can be regarded as an intensive contact which is created between me and some other person or with, between me and, say, more globally, the world in general. Uh, but this specific kind of contact, not only the distance between me and the other one, the person or object, is surmounted, but furthermore, information about the other one reveals in this contact, which is beyond any globalization. So we cannot fully explain what takes place when we are in touch with somebody. Um, touch, as well as our corporate experience in general, are always characterized by an a priori ambiguity, a dialectic reciprocal relation, a dissolution of, of the dichotomy between activity and passivity, subject and object. And that is something I want to refer to in this chapter when I speak about touch as concept. To explain in more detail what I mean by that, I would like to refer to this phenomenologist perspective, which has been created by no <coughs> but which has been um, worked out by other philosophers like the tool by the etc. Here, um, people were very interested in the way how we are embedded in the world by our body. And this embodiedness, embeddedness <laughs> with our body in the world um, shows a kind of specific reciprocity which is especially becoming apparent in the idea of touch. The reciprocal relationship between the touching person and the touched is rooted in what Maloponti called the double existence of the body. So, as Marukonti sees it, the body can neither be interpreted as pure consciousness nor as a pure object, physical object, in the world. Accordingly, the body has a kind of double existence, what means it is simultaneously an external being, a kind of physical object in the world, we like by our body, but on the other hand, it is a kind of experienced body. So we always, even if we are a physical body in the world, we are feeling for our body. We have a kind of conscious relationship to the body. Or I would say we are consciously a body. So there is a kind of ambiguity between a material object and a poor consciousness, which allows equally a view from the outside. We can regard our body as a kind of object or from the inside, we experience, we live in our body in the same time. Malokonti <coughs> speaks in this context uh, about two different concepts. He speaks about the core that is a subjectively experienced, touching body. And on the other hand, the core physical, that is the empirical, touched body. But however, he says, there are structures of one entity, the one existence. I would like to give an example for that. For example, if I see my hand, and if I, with this hand, I touch my other hand, we see the ambiguity of it. <laughs> with this hand, that is the experience, the subjectively experienced part of my body. I touch the body, which in this moment becomes a kind of an object. It is a physical instance. But on the same, mo the same moment, this hand is also something which is experienced by me because I feel how I am touched. So, and on the other hand, this hand feels how the other hand is touching it. So there's a kind of ambiguity, ambiguous relationship between touched 
and touching and being touched. And this is something which is really very interesting uh, concerning our contact to the world. Perhaps you can discuss about it. I'm not so sure if it's clear. Perhaps it's totally clear, and I'm speaking about that too long. But uh, as you are very in the dark, I have not this kind of interaction with you to get a feeling. It's really interesting. I'm really feeling like being on the stage. <laughs> I know I understand what the people, people say, say there's a kind of dark audience that no one knows. Okay. So the body and the mind, the intelligible and the empirical, are thus bound together via the body. But being a body not only means a constant mediation between inside and outside, as I just put it, but beyond that, as a physical body, one is always part of the world to which one refers in touching, acting, and reflecting. Uh, in touching something or someone, the physical object, therefore, does not only depend on subjective self-determination and on subjective intentions, but is also governed by the laws of the world, that is to say, by the own dynamics and the own sense of the phenomena which are touched by us. We are always in touch with the world beyond this concrete act of touching something, because we live as a physical being in a continuous fusion with the material and social world, which, of course, does not need to be applied towards us, but which restructures the forms of our actions by changing, resisting, and initiating them. Um, I think this shows very clearly you know, that with the idea of touch and the idea of this bodily embeddedness in the world, the dichotomy between the subject and the world, between the touching and the touch, is over overcome or is surmounted. Because there exists this continuous contact with the world. So you may say that the body subject and the way how this touching and touch are interrelated with each other or intertwined with each other, mark out a hardware sphere, as Naruto said, which guarantees a constant pact, which also implies a kind of overcoming the division into a recognizing subject on the one hand and the world which has been recognized by it. The unity of the touching and the touched, which becomes obvious in this physical being in the world, realized by our body, shows that in the experience of touch, there is not this distance between the subject and the world, which has been developed in the epistemological tradition. So, if you take all this into account, and if you think about this close relationship between touching and the touched, then we see that the dissolution of the cognitive philosophical duality of action and occupation uh, will be surmounted here by this constant contact with the world. Um, according to this old tradition, one could always distinguish between an active subject or an active instance which does something or touch something and a passive object number to whom, to whom something is happening or which is touched. This dichotomy is called into question if we take into account that the body always shows this general mixture of activity and passion, which we just make, uh, became clear by looking at this example of the hands. So the physical subject is always simultaneously giving and receiving you. We touch and we are touched by the object because our touching is already a reaction of our body to the questioning atmosphere which is given out by the touched opposite number. We act whereby our body is answering the opportunities dumbly presented by environment or the people around. And in the same situation, the same way, the opposite number is always acting and reacting within us. So a communication takes place between the aspect, between the phenomenon which we want to touch and ourselves. It is a kind of acting and reacting and intertwining of these two aspects 
which we have into account if we regard touch. I have an illustration of it because it's rather abstract as I told you before. For example, if you are looking at a sculptress which is working with a stone, she has some ideas concerning the idea of how she wants to build up this stone, how the sculpture should look like. That are her artistical ideas. True is she is approaching to the stone and she's touching it. And in the way she is touching it, she will change her intentions. That is to say that the material, the stone, has a kind of own dynamic, own sense to which the sculptress is answering. So it is kind of dialogue which develops in this situation. I spoke with some artists a long time, I mean, we had long discussions about that, and even a painter or even a musician uh, told me, they all told me, that it is a really kind of dialogue which takes place between the own intentions and the material which shows some own dynamic to which the artist has to answer. So artistic um, intentions always breaks down on what the material prescribes, allows, and prevents. And this is not only true for the physical material, but also for the social, culturally shaped material, like sounds and tones and musical harmony and something like that. For example, when I worked a very long time with these people uh, which were mentioned from you yesterday at Oka, so they told, uh, also they told me that these cultural shaped material of sounds and, and, and harmonies and something like that is a kind of resistance which always uh, meets the intentions of the artist. So that we really have to describe artistic creation more than kind of dialogue, than the idea of um, putting an idea into a work by really realizing the intentions. So artistic activity is therefore much more a process of resonance, of dialogue, and the controlled transformation of an idea into an office. This reciprocal relationship between the subject and the world is especially true for touch. By touching, the relation between the asking and the responding person or object is rather close. Activity and passivity are intertwined in this process because the touched person is reacting immediately by touching the other one, also in the way how the body behaves. For example, if I'm touching the skin of somebody whom I'm in love with, then the way this skin is reacting influences already the way how I touch it. So there's a content interaction between the touch and the touching instance. So this separation, which was typical for traditional epistemology between activity and passivity, is really surmounted by the idea of touch. So, however, if one accepts this premise that touching is never the sole product of a controlling and measuring subject, but rather touch can only continually be understood at the stage of its emergence and which indirectly and laterally unfolds in the specific reversibility through which the alternating encroachment of nature, sociality, and spirit expresses itself. Coming to the last part of my talk, touch as a silent and gentle dialogue with the world. So we, I think if you take all this in account what I told you until now, we may say that touch means having a silent contact with the world, the objects, other people. Silent contact means that there is a pre-discursive contact with the things or with other people before they have become experiences <coughs> or in French, we contact with the issues avant and son début, the issues dit. This idea of a silent speech refers to the fact that we are embedded in this continuous communication with the world, which becomes apparent in fact that we are always in touch with the world by touching and being touched. For example, when I'm sitting here in the chair, I'm touched by the world, even if I'm not totally aware of this. Uh, I'm touching it by myself and I'm touching, touched by the chair. And this continuous communication which I have with the world by being in touch with it creates an atmosphere which influences our approach to the world in general, which influences our cognitive acts to a large extent. 
This notion of touch as a continuous contact with the world is not only relevant in respect to our relationship to the so-called natural world around us, which does not exist as well know, but furthermore, it is important regarding our contact to others. Here we can distinguish between touch and concrete sense, that is the direct touch, shaking hands, embracing, erotic and sexual contact, and furthermore, but other one touch in a more metaphorical sense, that is contact through our bodies, gestures, glances, etc., which gives us a feeling of being in touch, of keeping touch, or of losing touch with others. And here I want to make an example which I really would like to put for discussion, because I'm not an expert in this field, the idea of improvisation, because I think it is a very good example for this kind of touch. Um, in former times, I was very often in, in concerts where people were improvising in jazz concerts. And I was always very amazed by this idea of improvisation, because there is a kind of contact which develops between people and between instruments and people. A contact which is not made explicitly, but which exists by glances, position of the body, the way tones are initiated, the way people are, 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 are making kind of movements. That's kind of continuous, very vivid dialogue, which is a kind of atmosphere in which this kind of improvisation, which kind of music arises, and which makes it possible. And that I would describe as a kind of touch in this metaphorical sense, but means to have the contact with the other one besides any explicit relation. Well, touch is creating a space of, I would say, in-between corporality, or in Germany, you would say, Zwischenleibigkeit, a contact between bodies or objects where signs and dialogues arise. Between the touching hand and the touch object or person, there is, and I would say that at least, there is never a total coincidence. In contrary, there is a kind of hiatus, dichotomy, which is responsible for the fourth going affordances, to take a concept of Jitsen, which is responsible for the fourth going dialogue, for the resonance and responsivity which develops in this a dialogue by touching in this metaphorical sense and which stimulates further dialogues and contacts. So to sum up, the intertwinedness, or as my Lopuzzi would say, the chiasmus between the touching and the touch points to a different approach to the world, which is no longer characterized by domination and control of an intentional active subject but which opens a new space of poises according to which subject and object build up a reciprocal relationship, well aware of the fact that the touching act is always a reaction to what is already initiated by the touched object. So we may conclude that touching is an act of responsivity, of resonance behavior, because we are always answering to the atmosphere and the affordances which are already given by the objects and persons around us, the objects and persons we want to get in touch with. In this way, touch is an open dialect with the world, which can never fully be made explicit nor be captured by reflection. Therefore, touch unfolds a different approach to the world, an approach which depends on this mode of resonance by the dialectic of activity and passivity. This implies to be open and sensitive towards the affordances of the environment and to be active and reacting instance in the same way to accept the strangeness and unavailability of the other and of myself. Being aware of the fact that autonomy and heteronomy are always existing in parallel to each other. This approach to the world can be compared with a kind of tender, gentle, and soft relation to the other, which is um, which takes place or which substitutes the old idea of domination and control, which has been characteristic or typical for our old epistemological approach of the world. So it was a bit pastoral at the end, but I want to like to mention. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really taken by this uh, resolution. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
it seemed to me this, this, uh, that, that one of the problems for 20th century music was the idealism of musical aesthetics of the early 20th century, the idealism of modernism. Um, Yes, um, I think it's...